All right, book of James. And uh, so take it out, either paper one, take your iPhone, your iPad, whatever your Bible's on, and turn to the book of James. And uh, so the New Testament has gotten towards the back. So probably easier to start at Revelation and work your way back to James. But uh, we're going to look at verses 5 through 8 today. And um, this is one of the great things um, about James. It is very rich in the truth of God. Uh, when you read through the book of James, you just gather some just amazing truths about really kind of how God wants us to live life. The thing is, though, is that sometimes it is painfully practical. And really kind of ultimately what I mean by that is that sometimes you read through the book of James, God begins to kind of chip away at some areas in your life, and sometimes it's painful. There's a great skit done by what's called the Skit Guys, and uh, these guys, they did the skit, and it was uh, uh, basically one guy was just average guy. He was like asking God, God, I need you to, to really kind of work in my life and to do some things in my life, and, and the other guy actually played God, and so kind of the conversation was such, as like, man, God, I really want to be more like you. I really want to strive to be all that I can and, and be a follower of Christ, and, and so God's like, you sure? Like, yeah, I'm sure. Really, you sure? Yes, yes. Do what you need to, God. Go ahead and do it. He's like, it's going to hurt. He's like, I can take it. I can do it. So he takes out the imaginary hammer and chisel and tink. Ow! You know, he kind of goes through this process that sometimes in order for God for, to, to kind of make us and mold us into his image, sometimes it's painful. And, and it hurts because we're, try, we're getting rid of some of that junk in our lives. Uh, to allow us to become more like him. Today's passage kind of almost is that way because a lot of times as we go through these trials that we talked about last week, in order to get through those, we need some guidance and we need some wisdom. And a lot of times God doesn't kind of give us that straight up answer that we want. And we're going to see kind of how he guides and direct that today. And so as we talk about just kind of this idea of enduring through these trials and kind of gaining this wisdom, I, I want you to know something. Those of us who are in ministry, we are not immune to it. And kind of had that wake-up call this week. Earlier in the week, um, probably if you haven't heard it by now, well, you're, you're, you know now. Uh, Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church out in uh, Southern California, um, his son committed suicide. Um, you know Rick Warren, a massive church there in Southern California, wrote the Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life. Uh, Doug Fields, who is youth pastor, is like a youth ministry guru now. And uh, um, his son had been battling mental illness for most of his life and just kind of got to that point where he was like, he had enough and he took his life. And, and Rick Warren... Uh, tweeted out this week, he says, in dark days, doctrine in your head is not enough. You need Jesus by your side. We can have all the knowledge about God up here, but sometimes in those dark moments, we just simply need Jesus to wrap his arms around. And as we walk through life, we need that wisdom. We need that wisdom. And so he starts off here in verse 5. He says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And, and, and this wisdom now is actually wanting to kind of like, we need this to kind of get through these trials. So let him ask God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Wisdom is required because even the faithful do not always know how to persevere, nor do we easily find the will to rejoice in the future blessings while enduring present trials. It's hard. It's hard to sometimes deal with some of the things that we deal with in life and have to sit there and go, but God, you say we need to rejoice. God, this hurts right now. Rick Warren is hurting, and he's having probably a very difficult time rejoicing. I mean, he knows it, but he's right in saying, listen, I may know it all up here, but I need Jesus to just wrap his arms around me, 
to kind of walk me through this process. And you know what? That for you, it may be something simple. You may be struggling financially. You may be struggling with something at work. You may be struggling, uh, you know, your marriage may be struggling. You, you may be just struggling just in life and the things that you've got going on. Know this, you may have it all up here, but it's God maybe taking you by the hand, maybe taking you by the arm and actually helping you walk through it. So wisdom, verse 5, wisdom means the knowledge of God's plan, purpose, and ability to love accordingly. It's his wisdom. It's his wisdom. It's not man's wisdom. See, see you're, we're going to see here that sometimes you know, we, we kind of want to dabble in the wisdom of the world, and we want to dabble in the wisdom of God, but God's saying, no, my wisdom is the only wisdom that's going to get you through. Hilary of Arles, who was a bishop there in the town of Arles back in the 400s, he says this, and this, now listen, this is like thousands of years ago. This is what he said. There's no need for perfect people. What we need is wise people. That's what we need. We need wise people. Because listen, if we have perfect people, if we're all perfect, there's no need for wisdom, right? We don't, we don't need that wisdom to get us through life because we're perfect. We need wise people to help guide us through that process. Ultimately, we need the wisdom that comes from God that wisdom comes from the implanted word of God in our hearts and in our lives. And Proverbs is probably the ultimate picture of that. Proverbs chapter 2. And listen, most of Proverbs was written by Solomon. Solomon had, had asked for, when he took, took over the kingdom of Israel, he asked God for wisdom. He said, God, of all the things that I could have, God, what I really need is I need wisdom to govern your people. Because they're a bunch of hardheads. I need your wisdom. And so God says, okay. And he gives him wisdom. So he writes a lot of this down. He says, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments with you, make your ear attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understanding. If you cry for discernment, let your voice, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then the Lord will discern, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come understanding, come knowledge and understanding. Chapter 4, starting verse 5, says, Acquire wisdom, acquire understanding. Do not forget to turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her. She will guard you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is is from God, and it's from his word, which means we need to be planted in it. We need to begin to dig our roots into God's word. Sometimes it means we probably need to transplant ourselves from maybe some kind of worldly wisdom book and plant ourselves in the godly wisdom book. But it all comes from God. So how does God give this? Because he says he gives generously, and without reproach, and it's given to him. Well, he's, number one, he's a giving God. He's a giving God. Listen to what uh, John says in 1 John chapter 5. He says, this is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, emphasis here, his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we've asked for in him, that he is a giving God. He gives to us. And he gives generously to all. And listen, generously for one may actually be generously different for another because it depends on the wisdom that we're seeking. He gives without finding fault. He gives without finding fault. Personal story. Middle school years, this is my BC years before Christ years, so understand that. I had, my, my, my parents had divorced when I was in fifth grade. I'm in middle school, and middle school was kind of a rough time for me. I kind of didn't want to be home and kind of experimenting with little things here and there. And so, so I was at my dad's, and so I stole a pack of cigarettes from him. And so get home, and so I'm like, you know, you know it's kind of the cool thing with the buddies and all that. So we're like going, I'm like trying to hide it. I'm sneaking around. And, uh, and so anyways, well, my, you know, doing it outside and stuff. And, you know, so I'm thinking, oh, I won't get in my clothes or, you know, I won't smell like it, you know. 
doesn't work that way. Anyways, and so I come home one day, and my mom's boyfriend was there. And so I come in, and he says, hey, I got there's something for you on the kitchen table. And I walk in, and there was that pack of cigarettes I stole. I was like, great. This is... This is going to hurt because I'm thinking there's a, a physical punishment that's going to kind of come along with this. And he says, he says, oh, so you want to you know, smoke? You want to smoke? All right. Well, hey, listen, if you want to smoke, this is what I want you to do. He takes a butt of the cigarette off and he says, I want you to chew it. You can get through that. Go right ahead. So I reluctantly took that whole side, you know, everything, put it in my mouth, started to chew. And that was it. I was done. Not one more time, and and needless to say, it's, it he was you know the the he said like kind of there at the end, I kind of got done with it, spitting out and all this other stuff. And he's like, man, you turned a really dark shade of green, <laughs> and uh, and I was I was not feeling too good. But here's the thing, there was no real punishment that came out of that. The wisdom that was there was that listen, this is a choice. If this is a choice you're going to make. I want you to understand kind of really kind of how nasty this is really going to be for you. That's why I said chew it and put it in your mouth. And so there really was kind of no fault for my parents because they understood. They could, at some point, they were kind of thinking in their mind, at some point, Jeff's going to ex- want to try to do something. Because I was at that point, I was, I was starting to kind of act out a little bit and some things that were going on in my home and and, and so, so it's like, I think my mom kind of fundamentally understood something that, okay, we need to kind of somehow some, use some wisdom to guide him through this process. And he answers those who seek wisdom. He answers. And listen, sometimes when he answers, when, he, when we ask for wisdom, understand, sometimes we don't get the specific answer. What we always get, though, is the principle. The wisdom is found in the principle, how we apply those principles to our lives. So as you guide, as you go through scripture, as you kind of dive into his word, what you gain most out of is you gain mostly the principles. There are some things that we don't have a specific answer for. Okay? Number one question with like, like, like a guy like Rick Warren. Okay, why? Why did God allow this to happen? There's not a specific answer for that. But there is a principle of understanding that at some point people make the choice. No matter how hard we try. But God is still God. And God is still a good God. And he's a loving God. And he's a just God. And he wants what's best for his creation. He wants what's best for his people. And so what is Rick Warren struggling through? Probably not necessarily the why, but okay, God, how are we gonna? How are we as a family gonna just get through this? How are we gonna strive to get beyond this? How are we gonna strive to see the blessing at the end of this tunnel? Matthew chapter seven, as I said last week, it said a lot of a lot of James kind of parallels the uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter seven, there at the end, it says, "If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children." How much more will your Father who is in heaven give you what is good to those who ask him? If we, being sinful human beings, know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more will our Father in heaven who created us, our maker, give us that which we need? You notice I didn't say that which we want. It's that which we need. gives like a father. And so what what is that wisdom that you need to get through whatever it is that you're going through? He simply says, come seek after me. Let your face be in my word and I'll give you that wisdom. He says, but if he must ask in faith, and in faith, it's that manifestation of that action, of understanding, okay, I'm going to God ask for wisdom, but I know that God's going to give it to me. Now, I'm going to go in faith without any doubting. Doubt. It's lack of faith. It's a divided mind. 
He says, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Faith trusts God without hesitation. It's like Peter stepping out of the boat when Jesus is walking on the water and he says, Lord, if that's you, command me to come out. He says, come on. Peter walks on water. Peter walks on water, but it's the moment that he doubts that he begins to sink. But here's the awesome picture there is that Jesus doesn't let him drown. He pulls him back up and says, you have little faith. Just focus on me. Don't doubt. Don't be driven by this because what happens here is that here doubt becomes willful disobedience and fails to apprehend the blessings of God. When we begin to doubt God and what he's doing in our lives, we fail to see the blessings on the other side. Ultimately, what's happening is that you call into God's question, God's character into question. You call his character into question. You begin to say, God, I don't think you can do this. God, I don't know if you can really get me through this. God, I don't think you understand what I'm going through. Ultimately, what's happening is you're combating the corrupt faith of the world. You know, of other worldly Christians who say, oh, you have to have this self-help book and that self-help book and this self-help book. And you got to go to this counselor. You got to go to that guy counselor. But for the most part, what we need is that godly wisdom. And he says, right here, he says, right here, focus on me. Don't ever doubt that God doesn't know what you're going through. Because he does. He watched his son suffer on the cross. Willingly taking the sin of mankind upon himself. He knows what you're going through. And he's there. He's there with us. And he goes on, he says, verse 8, he says, For that man ought not to expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, he's unstable in all his ways. That, that word double-minded literally means fickle. And it's the only time that, that we see this word. And it's, it's that word fickle. We all know people who are fickle, don't we? It's it, It's inevitable. It's just part of the human, human nature. Ultimately, what he's talking about here is a double-minded man who literally has one foot in the world and one foot in God. He's like riding the fence. He's listening to the people on one side. He's listening to God on the other. And ultimately, he's confused. He doesn't know which way to go. He's wavering. He's like that little dinghy stick, stuck out at sea, kind of just going back and forth, tossed by the waves. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what direction he's going. The result ends up being a divided loyalty that proclaims faith superficially and hypocritically. See, the more we kind of ride this fence in life, the more what happens is that people see somebody who has a very superficial faith and ultimately ends up looking like a hypocrite because they're being fickle. it leads to an ineffective faith with, non, with a non-authenticity of belief. A man is double-minded when he wants to have fun in the world, but also reign with God in heaven. Likewise, a man is double-minded when he seeks the approval of others for his good deeds rather than the spiritual rewards of God. That to gain wisdom means you have to have trust and faith that God is going to give you and grant you that wisdom. And what we see is that ultimately trials demand wisdom. And we all know that. We all know that when we're going through these struggles in life, we need that wisdom. We need that wisdom to guide us through it, to get us, to, to help us to see the light on the other side. You know what? Sometimes those trials... They're all unique to us. We all have different trials that we go through. But wisdom also demands prayer. It demands us seeking God's face. 
It demands us coming before God and asking and seeking and knocking and saying, God, I need you. Clearing the voices out of your head and just allowing God to speak. Prayer also demands faith. It demands trust. It demands us simply saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I know that you're going to be with me. That quote from Rick Warren earlier, that's ultimately what he's saying. He's saying, God, I, I don't know theologically how to kind of just navigate through this, but I'm going to hold your hand because I know you're going to guide me through. True wisdom was the knowledge of God's plan and purpose and ability to love accordingly. A wise person can identify the nature and purpose of the trials and understand how to overcome them. When you seek godly wisdom in the things that are going on in your life, you begin to see his purpose and his plan unfold for your life. And you see the nature of it. And you understand, okay, I have to maybe kind of go through this so that I know how to overcome at the end. Back when I was a kid, when my parents got divorced and going through all that mess, always, for years, always looked back and was kind of wondering, okay, God, why did you allow us to go through this? Ultimately, it's for me to come to Christ and, and for, me to, for, for me to begin to follow him. But, but I look back and I look at that experience and, and that kind of came to life a couple years ago when my in-laws got divorced and having to help my wife and my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law navigate through that process. That godly wisdom comes from being planted in his word. That's the first thing we take away. There are, you know what, there are 31 chapters in Proverbs. For the most part, there's 31 days in a month. It's a proverb a day. It's a proverb a day. What, what I do is I go through and, I'll, and each time I read through the proverb, there's just one verse that I highlight and I just kind of I kind of park myself on that verse for that day. And we kind of go through that process and you're gaining wisdom. You're staying in his word. We need that because that's his voice. but we also need that Paul in our life. We need that, that godly person to help us navigate with that godly wisdom, with those principles through whatever it is that we may be going through. We need that Barnabas. We need that Timothy to pour into. We also need to look for principles, not specifics. There are specific answers in Scripture to specific issues, but there are always principles to guide us through whatever it is that we're going through. So whatever it is it is that, that you're dealing with in life, quit looking for the specifics. Start looking for the principles of how God wants to guide and direct you through it. And lastly, ask, seek, and knock. Matthew chapter 7, starting verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. Everyone who asks receives, who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. Three different verbs that ultimately lead to three different things. Asking is just this verbal, God, I need you. Seeking is saying, God, I need you. And, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me here? Knocking is, okay, God, I'm ready to go. And you knock on the door. Sometimes we need to bang on that door. but trust that every single time he opens it. And it's this kind of level of progression and seeking this godly wisdom that we need for life. We need to ask for it. We need to seek for it. But then we actually need to say, God, give it to me. And it takes time. Sometimes it takes years but God gives it. 
And so I don't know where you are today. I don't know what God is doing in your life. I don't know what trials you may be struggling with. But I know this, I know that we're human and we all struggle with something. It begins with that relationship with Christ. When something breaks down in our house or in our car or, or whatever, normally what we do is, is we kind of begin to, we kind of look at it. For most of us, like me, it's like looking at it saying, okay, what's wrong? But then we kind of begin to pick it apart and we begin to kind of look for it. Sometimes we have to, we, we turn to the manual. Sometimes we have to turn to the creator. We have to call Whirlpool. We have to Call Dell, which if you have a Dell, it's normally on a regular basis. And and uh, but but you you call the you call the maker and, and you try to get wisdom from the creator. Well, here's the thing: think about your life in such a way that sometimes when things begin to go wrong in our lives, we need to turn to the manual and we need to turn to the creator. He's the one who made us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But the problem is, is that. We're, all, we're flawed. We're flawed. And God sent his son to take care of that flaw. And it's placing that faith, it's manifesting that action of saying, I need to be fixed. And Jesus is the only one that's going to fix me. Because I can't do it on my own. It's placing your faith, your hope, your trust in him that he comes in and he takes care of that sin debt in your life so that now you can live the life that God originally intended for you to live. And it's entering into that relationship. And so I don't know where you are today. Maybe for the first time today, you get it. You finally got it. You realize and understand that, listen, it begins with a relationship with God through his son. And so this is what I want you to do right where you are. Just, I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to look in your heart. I want you to look in your heart. Quit looking in your mind. Look in your heart. If you're here this morning and for the first time you get it, you understand it. That it's not about having a bunch of head knowledge about God. It's about having what I like to call a heart knowledge of entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ is what begins to transform you, to fix you, to make you into his image. If you're here this morning for the first time, you're ready to do that. This is what I want to do. If that's you and you're ready to do this, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say just a, just a little prayer. And, and it's not the power of these words. It's not anything. Uh, having a, There's no magic in them. It is just the attitude and the power of your heart. Before God, and this is what I want you to say, God, I am sorry. I, I, I have done things wrong. I am flawed. God, I need Jesus to begin to change me. God, I ask you forgiveness. And God, your word tells me that when I ask you to forgive me, you're faithful and just to forgive me because I know that Jesus paid that debt, my sin debt on the cross. He rose again so that I can actually live, I can live life. I may not understand a lot of it, God, but I, but I, but I trust you. I trust what you say in your word. And God, I ask Jesus now to begin to change me.